I'm supposed to turn this on. Uh, Sabbath School in the New Smyrna Beach Seventh day Adventist Church. Your mute is on. The mute. time I used this, these cords were not in my pocket, and I ended up getting caught up there and flipped out. We are studying lesson number nine in the Adult Sabbath School Lesson Quarterly, and uh, our study this week is Jesus ministered to their needs. Jesus ministered to their needs. Everyone have a quarterly? Okay. Do we have some extra quarterlies? I've got a couple right here. If you don't have one, check and see if someone close to you has one and close you up for them. this morning, lesson nine, the general subject is Jesus ministered to their needs. So here's the first question. What evidence can you think of in the Old Testament where Jesus ministered to the needs of Adam and Eve? His creation of human beings. What evidence can you think of where Jesus ministered to the needs of Adam and Eve? Very good. What about before that? Everything was beautiful. Everything was perfect. Yes. Jesus created everything that Adam and Eve would need before he created, created them. Yeah. Why do you think he did that? All the best. And he used to go down in the cool of the day and mingle with them. Yeah. And why do you think he was mingling with them? Why do you think he created everything that they would need before he created them? Love. love. He's trying to communicate what to them? Love. He wants to win their trust, their love, and eventually prepare them for a little test called loyalty. Does Jesus ever surprise us or allow Satan to surprise us before preparing us for an event or a surprise that he knows Satan is going to bring in our lives? Does he ever surprise us? Does he always prepare us first? Do you like that? Yes. Why do you think he does that? For the reasons that we just listed. He's trying to win our trust, our love, and our loyalty. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So to me, the first evidence of Jesus anticipating our needs is creating everything that we would need before He created us. <clears throat> How 
how did Jesus, according to Scripture, Genesis 1, 26 and 27, create us? In His image and His likeness. The Hebrew word for image, it's Selim, which is speaking of He created us internally with the ability to process information, things that we saw, things that we heard, so that we can make an intelligent choice And in so doing, impress us that we could trust Him and love Him and be loyal to Him. Does that make sense? Amen. The purpose of all of this is to prepare Adam and Eve to choose to be God-dependent instead of Do you think that the world needs to see a people that have learned to become God-dependent instead of... Amen. Is that a way of witnessing? Yes. Or meeting people's needs? Yes. So this is pretty strong evidence that Jesus anticipated the needs of Adam and Eve before, by creating everything, before... He created them. Then, in uh, Exodus, we learn that after 430 years of being slaves in Egypt, now Jesus fulfills His prophecy to Abraham by taking approximately 2 million people out of Egypt to Mount Sinai. And He takes... Two years, two months, and one day to do so. The longest route possible that you could possibly take, that's what Jesus to, to chooses. What do you think he's, why do you think he's doing, using this strategy? They've been slaves for 430 years. And he's trying to win their trust, their love, and their loyalty. He's meeting their needs because he knows what's ahead of them. Do you like that? Yes. Then he takes them to Mount Sinai and he says something very interesting to them in Exodus 19 verse 6. He says, I want for you to listen very carefully to what I'm going to say to you. That's what the word obey means in Hebrew. And then I want for you to keep, K-E-E-P, which means I want for you to guard, treasure, protect, appreciate what I'm going to say to you. That's what the word keep means in the Hebrew. It doesn't mean to go do something. It means to cherish, guard, protect, appreciate what I'm about to say to you. Why? Because I'm going to make you a nation of what? Priests? Why? So that they could meet the needs of the world. Isn't that what we're studying this week? The needs. How Jesus meets the needs. So that prepare them to go and give Bible studies to the surrounding world outside of Canaan. Four thousand years later, Jesus shows up in person, and he does something very interesting. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew 11, Matthew 11, and he's still trying to reach our hearts. Matthew 11, beginning with verse 28. Who would like to volunteer to read Matthew 11, verse 28? And 29. Volunteer. Do you mind standing up, Lois, so that we can all hear you? Thank you. Two very interesting words here that we need to understand. Two very, very important words. Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you 
and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. Thank you. What does the word rest mean? Do you know how the word rest is spelled in the Old Testament in Hebrew? S H A B B A T H. Shabbat. It means rest. How do you think this? What do you think the spiritual meaning of rest is here? What did Jesus ask Adam and Eve to do during the first 24 hours of their life? <laughs> Why? Were they tired? Are you kidding? This was the first 24 hours of their life. So why did you why do you think that he asked them to rest? Yes, the Shabbat. To appreciate the celebration of his creation. Did everyone hear that? Say it a little loud, please. Celebration of his creation. Celebrating a perfect in quality and complete in quantity creation. Anticipating, proving, and celebrating that he had anticipated all of their, what have we said in this week? Their need. I saw a hand over here. He wanted to establish a relationship. <laughs> That's the whole point. What kind of relationship? Trust, love, and loyalty. It doesn't change. So that's what the word rest means in Matthew 11, 28. He's giving people what? He wants to, for them to experience rest in who? Him. In Him. And what's the last word in verse uh, 29? Souls. Do you know how the word souls is spelled in Greek? P S E U C H E. Suke. Where we get the word psyche. Psychology. Psychiatry. What is he trying to appeal to here? Your brain. Mind. What was the problem with Israel? The Jewish people had approximately 369 things that you must not do or you would burn in hell. And about 160 something things that you had to do in order to be saved. Hmm. Would that mess up your mind just a little bit? Yes. During the day, you're not trying to keep track of 360 some things that you could not do? Huh? What kind of rest is that? <laughs> your mind would continue beyond that. Are there folks like that around today? Yes. Check it out everything you say and yes. do. And what do they do when you do something wrong? Oh. Say that a little louder, please, Bob. When someone does something wrong, since you brought it up, not me. <laughs> what does the Bible say we should do when we see or hear someone do something that they shouldn't do? Go to that person. Matthew 28, 15, 16, 17. First you get on your knees and say, Lord, I've seen something or heard something that doesn't seem right. Do you want for me to interact with this person? And you're on your knees asking God what to do and how to do it. And then you go and in a prayerful way say, I want to share something with you. I've seen you do something or whatever. And I want for you to know that I've had similar challenges in my life. And I believe in prayer, so you want to pray with me about this together? I'll be happy to do so. No, I'm not interested. I didn't do anything wrong. Now what do we do? Thank we go to the first elder, or the pastor, or both, and we share our experience so far. And we decide what's the best thing to do. And then, then we pray about it. Then we go to the person. Ah, oh, forget it. You know, you guys don't know what you're talking about. I don't need to go to your church, et cetera, et cetera. I, I've experienced that. Then, okay, so the point is what? There's a way to do things. Tell them, girls. 
We're trying to reach their hearts. Loyalty or trust, love, and loyalty. I saw a hand over here. I think sometimes we worry too much about our horizontal relationship rather than our vertical relationship. If we, if we did more with our vertical relationship, we probably wouldn't have to adjust other people's ideology as much. Wow. Did you hear that illustration? I used that last time. Regarding peace. Folks, I have bad news for you. You're never going to experience peace on this earth horizontal. But if you're focused on what this brother just shared with us, God guarantees his peace. And that is what Jesus is trying to communicate to these people here in Matthew 11, 28 and 29. He wants for them to experience his rest and he wants to give them peace of mind. So what can you and I do to minister to the needs of others? Like dealing with diseases or illnesses. Let me share a medical fact with you. I was asked by an insurance company to develop an insurance policy for people that uh, were uh, employees of certain type of businesses, industries. And I became acquainted with the word actuaries and actuarial tables. You know what an actuary is? <laughs> an actuary is a person that assembles information, facts, about men and women. And they start out by age. Then they look at lifestyle, how much we weigh, what do we do for a profession? Do we drink, smoke, take drugs? And I learned something absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. What I learned was that people that are self-employed heal faster from an illness or an injury than anyone else. <laughs> you know what? Yeah, they have to because they're not going to get paid. They don't have workers' yeah, exactly. comp insurance. Say that again. They don't have workers' comp insurance. Okay. <laughs> Pastor? I'm self-employed, I can tell you. The motivation is <laughs> The motivation is what? To drain that policy that they have down to dry? Or to get back to work to their business, to grow their business? Yes, get back to work. <laughs> what should our motivation be? What is our motivation as Christians? Especially the message that we have been given as a church. What, our, what should our motivation be? The love of Christ inside of us. And the love toward our brothers and sisters. Our love for our brothers and sisters. We should also, Bob? I'm sorry, we should also act as though we're self-employed. And what's our, what business do, what, is, what, are, what business is it that we own? So we want to get back into action. The business of sharing the gospel. Yes. Did everyone hear that? The business of sharing the gospel. Whose responsibility is that? Yeah. And in sharing the gospel, what are we doing? Meeting the spiritual needs of people. That's what we're studying this week. Meeting the needs of people. How did Jesus meet the needs of people? Yes. You would? Yeah, there's an awesome statement in uh, Mount of Blessing 107. It says, God sends you into the world as His representative. In every act of life, you are to make manifest the name of the Lord. This petition calls upon you to realize His character. This you can do only through the acceptance of the righteousness of and love of God. Amen. So the job description is pretty clear. Amen. 
God sends you into the world as who? His representative. Then he says, you need to possess my character. So all I'm asking you to do is receive it. What does receiving involve? Faith. Faith. There's another statement in Christ's Object Lessons, page 339. By the atmosphere surrounding us, everyone with whom we come in contact will be consciously or unconsciously affected. What does the atmosphere mean? What atmosphere does Jesus guarantee we will experience so that we can meet the needs of others? The Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. Abide in me. You're the branches. I'm the vine. And if you focus on abiding in me, Jesus says, I'll take care of the fruit production. Do you like that? Some people say, Chuck, I hear you talk and teach, and you're very, very soft on words. You're kind of too heavy on faith. You're way too heavy on faith. You're not plugging works enough. Well, what does Scripture say? Remember what happened after Jesus fed 5,000 people and then went and walked on the water? They met the next day and the people came to him. Let's read it. John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Verses 1 through 14 talks about Jesus feeding 5,000 people. And 15 to 25 talks about him walking on the water. Now what happens in verse 26? John chapter 6, verse 26 to 39. Who would like to read that for us? John chapter 6. 26 to 39. 29. Volunteer? Okay, Carl? <clears throat> Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, You seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which, was, which perished, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, What shall we do, that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Is that word faith again? And who's saying it? Jesus. Jesus. So if you think I'm soft on works, I'm just sharing. Didn't the people want to go out and do things? What did Jesus say? Cool it with the doing, or right now, and focus on the what? Abiding. Which is another way of reaching their what? Psyche. Appealing to their trust, love, and loyalty. Does that make sense? Right out of Scripture. Okay. What do we learn from the lesson this week regarding which comes first, works or faith? Let's take a look at it. In Mark chapter 16, Mark chapter 16, last chapter in Mark, verses 17 through 20. To read verse 17. Okay. And this, and this sign shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven okay. and set. Mm -hmm. okay. So, verse 17 again. And these signs, the Greek word is attesting miracles. 
Isn't that what we're interested in doing? How could we do what Jesus did? Are we studying meeting people's needs this week? Yes. This is the recipe here. So instead of focusing on the works, what's the first thing that precedes the works? And these signs will accompany or follow those who have what? Believe. There's that word faith again. By the way, the word faith and believe in the Greek comes from the same root word, pisteo. Okay? So when you see the word believe or faith, it's the same word in the original language. These signs, these miracles, will accompany those who have believed in my name. That's quite a list. Casting out devils. Raising people from the dead. Would that get people's attention? Yes. But even the devils also get He does things that are similar, but are not similar. That's right. See that going on? He cannot raise dead people. He can't create. That's a creative process. When somebody's dead, that's a creative process. Only God has that ability. Many years ago, in 60 Minutes, they did a special on the healing ministries on television. And they followed up after the so-called miracles took place. And 100% of these visual miracles, people were in worse condition for a period of time. So it was an emotional reaction that they had. I forget when it was, it was years ago, years ago. What does Jesus tell us in John 14, 12 through 16? It's a passage that all of you are familiar with. John 14, 12 through 16. Who would like to read that for us? Over here? Linda? Is it Linda? Yes. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do. Also, <coughs> and greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Thank you. What's the very, what's the very first thought that is mentioned in verse 12? Truly, truly. In other words, this is important. This is important. I say to you, he who what? Yes. There it is again. Is it important to recognize that Jesus, when he was on this earth, recognized his limitations? Some people say, oh, Chuck, that's blasphemy. <laughs> well, I'm thinking of John 5, 19 and 30, where Jesus says, I myself can do nothing. And then in John 14, 10, this is what just, I cannot handle this. Jesus says, I didn't even take the initiative to open up my mouth and say anything. But I spoke only as the Holy Spirit impressed me with himself. Is Jesus our example? Yes. yes. Is that good advice? Yes. It's good news, isn't it? Okay. So what is the point here? Here's that word K-E-P again in John 14, 15. If you what? Love me. That's, that's the appeal. It's still the appeal. It doesn't change. He's trying to reach my what? My loyalty, my love, and my trust. Then he can do something through me. Then you will keep, K-E-E-P. What does that mean? Cherish. The Greek word is tereo, T-E-R-E-O. Guard, protect, appreciate, cherish my promises to you. 
I know that in the English language we associate the word keep, K-E-P, with 